Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white out. Jesus, church, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know that he paid for it all? When he said it is finished on that cross. Let's just keep in the spirit of prayer. Let's just keep in the spirit of prayer. The spirit of thanksgiving for all God has done for us. I know for myself that when I look back over the last month, over the last week, I know what God has done for me. I know what God has done for my family. I know what God has kept me. Each and every single member of my family, God has been faithful to me. In your own words, in your own way, please pray. Give God thanks. This isn't a light subject. It's important. When we give him praise, when we give him thanks, it's like it's, it's sweet he's ears. Let us never be ungrateful for what God has done in our lives. Father, God, I know what you've done for me. I know what you've done for each and every single member of this ch church family, Father. They will have their own stories to tell about how faithful you have been. Father, God, I know how faithful you've been to me. I know how you've never left me. Father, I know in times of difficulties, you've always been there. I know in times of difficulties for my family, you've always been there, Father, God. I know, Father, God, when even if people in my family have had issues with health, Father, God, you have been there. You've reassured us you've been faithful, Father. Let's never take it for granted. Let's just keep praying. Please, please, please. If there's one thing we can do today, if there's nothing God's which you can do today, please be thankful. Pray. Say thank you to God. Say thank you to God. Thank you to God. For the moments in which people have seen in your life, for the moments in which people haven't seen in your life, just keep saying thank you. We say thank you, Father. We say thank you. A heartfelt thank you, Lord. A heartfelt thank you for everything you have done, Father God. We are so thankful. 
We are so thankful. We pray, Father God. Even in our prayer session, Father God, we say we are trading our sickness and pain for your joy, Father God. Father God, the sickness and pain in which only we will know in our own quiet time, in our own prayer session, Father God. We trade all of it for your joy, Father God. And we just want to say thank you. The suffering in which you have had, Father God, we put it at your feet and we say thank you. Because, Father God, we know that come the end of it, your name will be glorified. Even today as a collective, Father God, we glorify your name. We say thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the heads on our head. Thank you for what you've done with our family. Thank you for the results in which you have had. Thank you for the health in which you have managed for us, Father God. Thank you for the way in which you have managed us over the course of August, Father God. This you take over. We've had no reason to cry. We've had no reason to mourn. We've been so faithful, Father God. For the people that have come, for the people to go. Father God, for the 30th anniversary, Father God, that the church has celebrated this year. For the fact that once again, we have come together as a community. Let's not take it for granted. These are big things, these are important things. Left, but we say all the same because you know that our thanks is sweet to your ears, Father God. Father God, this is our way of letting you know that everything we should do for us, Father God, even the things we should see, Father God, we don't take for granted. Lord, we know what you do for us. We know what you do for us in our quiet place. Those things in which we, we don't even want to say and admit to ourselves, Father God, that you've done for us, Father God. We say thank you, Father God. We say thank you. Father God. We say thank you. Your never ending grace, Father God. Your never ending grace, Father God. That even we fall away from the floor, Father God, you find a way to keep us back. That even we fall away, Father God. Even with all our shame and all of our, our sense of guilt, Father God, you allow us to come back into the floor once again. We say thank you, Father God. Not just myself, myself, my family, every single member of this church, Father God, we say thank you. We know us. And Lord, even if you don't realize what you have done for us, we know that one day you shall touch our heart and we shall know well and truly what you have done for us all in our life, Father God. Let's just pray for ourselves now. As individuals, obviously we've given thanks to God, but we know that in our own quiet places, there are many things in which God has done for us. But even when we're praying for ourselves, let's give everything in which we can, the things in which we have done during the week in which we look at and we say that we know we shouldn't have done. The things which we've done in the week and we know that we need to be better in the next week. Let's just pray for ourselves that, Father God, please, well and truly, you shall renew our minds. And we come to you collectively as a church family, Father God, and we say renew our minds. Do not allow us to be conformed to this world, Father God, but allow us to be, have our minds and our eyes set on you fully. Father God, in every single way in which we can, Father God, we say thank you for what you have done for us. And we say, Lord, the issues of my heart, I speak to you as an individual. I speak to him as an individual. I speak to him as an individual for myself. Father God, you know the issues of my heart. Please, Father God, renew them. I ask you to renew my mind, Father God, once again, Father God, this yoke which we carry day after day. We do it as a collective, as a church family, but we also do it as individuals, Father God. And Father God, we are asking you as individuals that once again you shall renew our mind, Father God. Father God, for all the things which you have done for me, I'm asking you and I'm praying to you, Father God. I want to ask for better, I want to ask for more. I want to ask for forward momentum. Father God, these are the issues of my heart. I don't know the issues of your heart, so you need to pray for yourself. But these are my heart, I know them, and I know that, Father God, I'm trusting them to you. I'm trusting you for full momentum. I'm trusting you for grace. I'm trusting you for direction. I'm trusting you in so many ways, Father God. I'm trusting you for a vision. A vision well and truly, Father God. Let's continue to pray for ourselves. Let's not even think about the things which we have done that we, we know that we need to do better at. But let's commit to God the things in which we have in our hearts that we're praying towards. Those things in which we have been praying towards for time, for a long time, and we're even looking at God and we're saying, God, what do I need to do to get this from you? Father God, please, in your own way, in your own way, come and meet us halfway, Father God. Allow us to continue to find time to fellowship towards you. Father God, please, the desires of our hearts, meet us halfway. We speak about references all the time, Father God. Allow the people of the church to have their references, Father God. The issues of people's heart, Father God, whether it's fruit of the room, the issues of people's heart, whether it's got a job, the issues of people's heart, whether it's matters of hope, Father God. Please meet them halfway, Lord. For each and every single member of the Fat Sanctuary family, Father God, 
meet them halfway so that they have that point of reference. So that in moments of doubt in the future, they know well and true that this is God I serve. I know this is God I serve because I know at this moment when I was waiting on him, he met me halfway. He was there for me. When I had no way out, when I had no direction, he met me there and he created that direction. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You know the issues of my heart, Father. You know everything which I want to pour out to you, Lord. Everything which I've experienced this week, everything I've experienced this month, Father God, for every single member of the sanctuary family, please, Father God, we, we lay it all towards you. We bear it towards you. We bear it towards you, Father God. And we know that, and we pray this prayer because you know that you're the only person, Father God, or rather you're the only thing, or the only entity, Father, that can, that can provide some sort of avenue for it, Father God. We know that when we pray, it's words up into the sky. It's words to you, Father. But we know that without you, without, without your presence, without your grace, Father God, the words in which come out of our mouth are to no value. Father God, we know that you move these words, Father God. As they come into the heavens, Lord, we ask that you manif make them manifest in Jesus' name. Father God, please, for every single member of this church, these issues in which you have in our hearts, please, let's just keep pouring it out. Let's not be quiet. Let's keep pouring it out. Let's keep pouring it out. These issues of our heart, Father God, please, in your own way, meet us halfway. Create references that people know why it is that they serve this door, so that when they come into moments of difficulty, they may say, no, for this one, I know my Lord. Because in this month of August, when I had this issue, it was you, Father God, who met me there. When I was raising on you, it was you, Father God, who provided a way forward for me. Not just for myself, but for my family, Father God, in every single way in which we can. I just want to say thank you. And Lord, all these issues of my heart, which I put out to you now, for those in the, who are not in the church today, Father God, we act as intermediaries for them, Father God. The issues of their heart, Father God, we ask too, Father God, that you meet them in their own way. We give you thanks, in Jesus' name. Um, one thing which I really want us to pray about, um, besides these issues of our, our heart is obviously we know um, that during the entire month there's been a point made about the importance of depression um, and you know it's funny actually because I invited somebody last week because it was I am Andrew and um, you know she said that one of the things in which she really appreciated um, is how depression was spoken about um, in a more solution based way or positive light because within our communities it's not always the case I said within our communities that's not fair in general it's not always the case that this is um this happens to be the way in which depression is spoken about but i'm just going to read some statistics from use for mind mental health charity it's talking about prevalence it says according to mind black and black Brit black and black british people are more likely than average to experience a common mental health problem in any given week with 23 percent reporting one in 2017 in 2015 a study found that 17.7 percent of black caribbean participants reported depressive symptoms, which was higher than white European participants at 9.7% and South Asian participants at 15.5%. And with respect to the youth, especially as the Youth Takeover Month, it says, black youth and adults report a high prevalence of dysphemic disorder, which is now called persistent depression, depression disorder in the SM5. This may explain the increase in suicide amongst black adolescents from 6.7 per 100,000 in 2007 to 11.8 um, per 100,000 in 2017. This issue of depression is not one in which we can take lightly. Um, as I just read there, we can see that we cannot even look at it in a blanket way. We know that it affects our communities disproportionately based on the evidence which is there for Mind Mental Health Charity. I want us to really pray that for those who feel the weight of the world on their shoulders, for those who see this as their present reality, that God will find a way for them, that they will know that God is with them, that in their own way, God shall, shall, he shall be their Ebenezer, he shall open the door for them. Let's just pray for them. Father God, we want to say thank you for all of those even among us who are suffering from depression. Who may, Father God, for those who feel down, for those who feel low, for those, Father God, who are confused, Father God, we ask that you make a way for them. Father God, we ask that you make a way for them. Really well and truly, Father God, make a way for those who are suffering from depression. Father God, from those among us who are confused, from those among us who are trying to find sense of what is going on in their life, Father God, and who feel empty, who feel a sense of confusion, who feel a sense of directionless, Father God. Father God, provide them direction in Jesus' name. Help them, Father God. Help these people. Father God, we know that depression does not always manifest itself visually, Father God. We cannot necessarily always see that someone is oppressed. Someone can be coming within our midst, Father God, every single week, every single day. We'll be praying with them, we'll be smiling with them, Father God. But we don't know the issues of their heart. You know the issues of their heart. Father God, each and every single person, whether they are among us, whether or not they're here, we've been Stratford, whether they're here, we Father God. We ask well and truly, Lord, 
that you meet them halfway. Help them, Father God. Allow them to know that you are with them. Allow them to know that you are with them. Allow them, in fact, to know that you have never departed them, Father God. Please be with them. Be with them well and truly, Father God. And Father God, if there's any practice or any any culture or any anything which we even exercise in this church that shall then anyway it increases or, or adds to this depression, Father God, we are rebuking in the name of Jesus. Father God, help us be transformed, Father God, that we shall be a church community well and truly. That if there's anyone who is suffering from depression, that they shall have a way to someone to talk to. That they shall have someone in which they can reach out to. Allow us to be proactive. Allow us to well and truly be our brother's keepers, Father God. Each and every Father God. Never allow us to take these things for granted. Father God, we just read, we know how it takes lives. We know how it affects us disproportionately based on the evidence, Father God. Father God, please help us. Help us, Father God. And Father God, we extend this prayer not just to ourselves, but all of our other, all of our other brothers and sisters, whether from different faiths, Father God, our Muslim brothers and sisters, you know, our Sikh brothers and sisters, our different races, Father God, or white British, whatever, Father God. We ask, Father God, that in your way, this prayer shall be extended unto them, that this prayer of depression, Father God, in any way, shape, or form that touches us, we rebuke it, Father God, and we ask that as a community, Father, we, we handle ourselves in such a way that does not have the ability to fester among us, Father. Please help us, Father, but never allow us to take this for granted. Thank you, Father, Lord. thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, thank you. Thank you. And just to, to, to wrap that up, I, I just want to um, reference something in Psalm 16, um, the conscious of which. David, of course, he'd experienced depression. He's essentially celebrating um, his relationship with God. And he's testifying to the life that his relationship with God has allowed him to have. And in Psalm 16, verses 11, verses 11, sorry, not one. I'll read it from here, New King James Version. Thank you, though. It says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Father God, we've committed um, ourselves as a church family into your, into your heart, into your hands. Father God, we've committed those who struggle with depression into your hands. Father God, we ask that in your own way, we shall also experience that fullness of joy, Father God. That for those who are experiencing that, that, that sense of emptiness and loneliness as their present reality, Father God, we know their destination is far greater. We give you thanks and we give you honor. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry. <clears throat> So before um, I go, I do have one other thing to say, and it's, um, it's in line with the prayer. Thank you so much. Obviously, as, as you all know, depression has been a consistent theme. Um, we've just prayed about it. And please, if you do need help, there is um, a really useful, a really useful um, service you can sign post, we're trying to signpost you to, um, naturally, which is the NHS, NHS service, um, which gives you references regarding um, issues to do with depression um, in terms of free listening services, whether it's getting in touch with Samaritan or getting in touch with the Crisis Text Helpline. And even further down, um, it shows you how um, mental health is treated in the A&E if it's uh, an episode which is specifically so important that it's to be dealt with. Um, we'll probably pass this by at a later time, but thank you very much for having me. God bless you and may the service continue to give glory to his name. Thank you.
Hallelujah. Good morning, church. We can all be seated now. Thank you so much. Just want to welcome you, everybody, to the last Sunday of the month of August, which is Youth Takeover. <laughs> My name is Ianu, and I will be your MC for this service, apparently. <laughs> So just a quick um, announcement that throughout today's service, we'll be reading out the testimonies um, that we've gathered throughout the month. So just in case anyone has forgotten or has a new testimony that has been delivered to them, thank God, please, um, we'll point yourselves to the ushers who will be able to collect your testimony so that we can include you in today's service. Um, also, another quick reminder that to properly wrap up the youth takeover this month, we'll be having a praise night on Saturday. So that'll be a fun time of celebration, music, thank you, and more fellowship. So um, just to quickly introduce our fellow Uncle Ayi for Sunday School today, where we'll be going through the outline. Very interactive session full of questions and answers, and hopefully we'll be able to learn a bit more. So let's introduce, or let's welcome Uncle Ayi to the stage, sorry. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, Ian. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the mercy you've given to us this morning. We ask, Lord, please come and help us again. As we always ask, please prepare our hearts for your word. Prepare your word for our hearts in Jesus' name. Let every one of us live here with that testimony that we have just sung in the hymn. That, Lord, you take us deeper and deeper even into the very character of Christ in Jesus' name. Daddy, we return all the glory to you. Thank you for the children you've been using in the month of August. Please, Lord, we pray that you will continue to use them more and more in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for it's in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Please, um, it's time for Sunday school. So children and teenagers, please go to your classes. Let's clap for them and their teachers. Let's appreciate God for his mercy upon their lives. Hallelujah. All right, you're all welcome to church. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, Sunday school is when we gather together to look at God's word. We ask questions, we take comments, and um, we just look at his word the way, you know, he has written it for us. Praise the Lord. Um, this morning, very quick announcements. This is the last Sunday school, sorry, this is the last Sunday in this Sunday school year. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you want to clap for Jesus, clap for him. God has helped each and every one of us. Um, by his grace, 52 Sundays, he has been very, very faithful. So please, from next Sunday, we'll be needing a new Sunday school manual. We're encouraging each and every one of us. It's just six, it's six pounds 50. You want to see Sister Rachel and Sister Ifai, please, to get a copy for next Sunday. We have um, some interesting topics we're going to be looking at um, from next Sunday. You know, we'll start with empathy. There is even midlife crisis. There's anger management. Unity in marriage, power of forgiveness, parenting God's way. There's even sexual perversions. There's uh, loneliness. So, so many things. Please make sure you get a copy. The Lord will bless each and every one of us in Jesus' name. All right, this morning we're looking at natural disasters. That's the topic we want to consider. I'm conscious that we have not co covered all the topics for this year, but we thank God because he has helped us thus far. So please, if you have your manual, do read the remaining two. You know, sometimes in school, when the lecturer is teaching you, they tell you, go and read the rest for your exam. We have not been able to cover everything. Praise God. God has helped us. So please, uh, feel free to do further studies at home. And if you have questions, feel free to come and ask. Natural disasters. Matthew 24, verses 6 to 8. Matthew 24, 6 to 8 is our text this morning. Matthew 24, verse 6 to 8. So please, if you find it, help us read it very quickly. Matthew 24, 6 to 8. Anyone helping us? Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 8. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, 
this at the beginning of service. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearts in Jesus' name. A memory verse, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. Let's read together. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. Again, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Matthew 24, verse 7. Do you want to do it one more time? Okay, since that book is already ready to, to help us. Please, let's give Sister Book a mic. Yes. Matthew 24, 7. A nation, a nation shall arise against nations, kingdom against kingdoms, and there shall be heart, um, there shall be no, no, I will say it, don't worry. And there shall be famines. She's saying don't help me. <laughs> and there shall don't be famines. <laughs> 24, Matthew 24, 7. <laughs> and, king, and nations shall arise against nations, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Matthew 24, 7. She's our A-star student. <laughs> Praise God. All right, that's, that's the text this morning. That's the memory verse. We're going to be looking at the profile of natural disasters and why God allows it. Praise the Lord. That's what we want to consider this morning. Matthew 24, 7. Now, what is a natural disaster? One of the questions we get asked um, every now and again is, which is what we, uh, we will ask ourselves as well. Why does God allow Natural disasters are challenge, challenge the Christian belief that God is good. Hello? Has anybody asked you that question before? If God is good, why would he allow so many babies to be killed in the Middle East? Why would he allow famine? Why would he allow all of these things? Have you had that question before? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Good place to start. So what was your response? You first take a deep breath, okay, and then you answer them. What did you answer them? <laughs> you take a deep breath and uh, look at the person. Why must he choose that um, question? Why must he choose that question? It is well. Well, if you balance yourself, you can say, well, do you not see the goodness of God today? Okay, if, okay. Uh -huh. Sister then, Stephanie is saying, yeah, you ask the person the yeah, question too. Have you not seen the goodness of God today? Yeah, if you have seen the goodness of God, and the same God is also the same God that will rescue every situation. That's okay. the way I will present it. What is the, th thank you, Ma, what is the, the, what is the quickest, should I ask, the most recent disaster? Okay. Did, did I hear? Ma? The recent one that covered the whole earth, uh -huh. the COVID. COVID made everybody, okay, okay. And did, did someone ask you, did God tell you that COVID was coming? Or why did God, does God allow COVID? Anyway, let's look at what our outline says. It says here that the enormous loss of lives and properties resulting from pandemics, earthquakes, floods, etc., is terrible and tragic, right? Um, Many times we grieve. We know families, we've lost loved ones, even in the last, uh, in COVID-19. And um, you hear you know, plane crashes, you know, you know, we've heard of the one of the yacht, you know, recently. But as much as we grieve, can we grieve more than God? Anyone? Is it possible that the natural disaster pains you so much more than the God that the people, you know, the God that created the people? No? Hebrews 4.15. Let's just read a few, a few scriptures. Someone help us. Hebrews 4.15. Another one, John 11.35. Yes, ma. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. This high priest of ours understands all the weaknesses, all of the troubles that we are going through, all of the grief. There is no grief that would go through that 
this high priest does not understand. In John eleven thirty five, 35, what does it say? And Jesus wept. Why? Because, because of Lazarus, his friend. Jesus wept. So he understood the grief that Lazarus' family was going through. The question simply is, could God who loves us also be the one to destroy us? See, that question is like this. Could God who loves us also be the one to destroy us? I can see people nodding. People are doing it like this. Just vocalize it. Does the God who loves us also destroy us? Okay, that yes is more. Yes, no? Destroy, earthquake. Okay, so you can consume. Okay, so how do we reconcile the mercy of God? How do we reconcile the mercy of God in Christ with his permission of natural disasters? How do we take, how many of us believe God is merciful? Very merciful, right? How do we take that his mercy and reconcile it with, does God permit nat natural disasters? Yes, so how do we reconcile the two? It's part of life. <laughs> okay. Okay. Matthew 24, 6 to 8. Very quick text review. And then we'll look at the profile of natural disasters. The six. Please, anyone in, who's got NLT for us, let's just see if we can pick a few things from that text. You will hear wars and threats of wars. Please, the whole class, let's listen so that we can contribute. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Praise the Lord. What do we take from the text? There's, there's more to come. Okay, yes, Debs. Um, what I think we take is that natural disasters or disaster in general is inevitable. So even though um, Christ has saved us from sin and ultimate death, the consequences of sin, of sin are still in the world. So the Bible's very clear about the fact that this world is passing away and it will all pass away at some point. Um, so those things are going to happen because of the consequences of sin. But reconciling it with mercy is also understanding what God has saved us from. He hasn't necessarily saved us from earthquakes and floods. Like Christians still die. Mm. Or like I was doing workers meeting today, like with First Peter, Christians can and do still die. Um, but he so saved us from ultimate destruction. So our souls will not die. We'll have a new body. Like we have a new hope that's not in this world. Amen. So yeah. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for that. Deborah is saying there that, look, um, maybe as she was speaking, what came to my mind is even if we did not do global warming, is there so, even if we did not, even if we were all making sure that we didn't dig, you know, you know, all the kind of protests that we have that we so because of our activities, that's why everything in the world, you know, there's farming, there is um, uh, deforestation, etc. Is it possible for human activities, having read that scripture, is it possible for human activities to prevent any of those things from happening? Yeah? Praise the Lord. All right, so I think... <coughs> Excuse me, I believe we agreed on that one. Then it says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And it says, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things, nations will rise against nation. Are we seeing that today? Yeah. Yes, all over the place. Misunderstanding. So it's, God has put all of this into his plan. Please, any more thoughts, any more comments, please? Any more comments? Yes, yes, Prof. Gunga. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So my thinking is, is it that um, because God saw the future, so mm. he said there'll be war, there'll be, you know, so it's not really that like, it's God that's causing it. Mm. So, um, I mean, we just clarify that. 
mm. unless mm. if you have a contrary in opinion. So <laughs> I believe God already saw that it's going to happen. Like you know, because it's the Alpha and Omega, so you know that he has. Uh, I'll be talking now. So God has already said, okay, we're having being I will talk on that day. Amen. Not that it's because I'm talking. It's not because because it's not God because said there's war. Then war. Then, then I now have to do no, war. No. So you already is, knew that you will be talking. Yeah. So it's okay. human being. Is this Putin and uh, that didn't agree? And uh, what's his name? It's not because God said then put then Putin must go to war. No, it is no, that no. it is that God knew that uh, uh, Putin is going to be okay. Thank you very much, Abro. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. I just believe that uh, this was just part of the master plan, mm. the original plan of God. And uh, we all know that. We know we believe that God is a suffering God. Yes, sir. He does what pleases him. And what we call evil as men might not actually be evil to God. Mm. Because eventually, maybe there's something God wants to bring out of it. So for us as human beings, we we'll see it as evil, but before God, it might not actually be evil. Uh, when we, uh, personally, when I read the first f uh, five chapters of the Bible, we are, uh, the, I mean, children of Israel were moving from Egypt and uh, they were fighting different cities and, you know. Now, what we ask, the first question I, I mean, that came to mind was that these people, they, they were killing, what did they do? Even mm. when we know that maybe they didn't know the God of Israel. Not that, I, I mean, I'm not sure somebody, I mean, someone has preached about the God of Israel to them to before. Them. So, but God has them to go to that land and, take the, and land. take the land. So the question is that, was God a wicked God at that point in time? But it's just that, that is his master plan. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you, sir. Thank you. As brother is saying that, that it's all part of God's master plan. Okay, we have two more. Sister Mokwe and yes, Mokwe. Thank you. I just want to read the scripture, yes. um, Isaiah 45, mm. verse 7. It says, um, this is God talking, and he said, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and I create calamity, and hide the Lord do all these things. Wonderful. My sister is saying, who, who, who is doing all these things? Who is doing all these things? It says, I form light, I form darkness. I create peace, I can also create calamity. How I, the Lord, I do what? All these things. Okay, thank you very much, sis. She's saying there that, look, God has written it. Our brother, Brock Winger mentioned something that, okay, God has seen how the heart of man will be in the years to come. He knows that, see, everything, the man, man fell, right? Everything we're seeing here is just a function of the fall. It's just the fall that is playing itself out. And God already knows that's going to happen. He knows how, he knows I will be here. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows what you're thinking. He knows even in the future how you will, you know, forgive or refuse to forgive, and what kind of fight that can bring that will bring in the family. Praise the name of the Lord. All right, thank you. Yes, one last one, Dickin Boy. Praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> I think that the Bible talks about um, God works known to Him from the beginning. All His works are known to Him from the beginning. So. Um, he knows the beginning and the end. And he created everything within um, the existence from the beginning to the end. So, And um, all these things are also part of the architectural designs of the end, which he has um, crafted to remind humans also of his coming. Because um, those things will also remind us that yet as much as we tend to know so much but there are things that we cannot control and those things are things that God alone can control so it keeps us those are the things that keep on telling us that God is sovereign and there's a God that we need to know about we need to sort him and like what happened during the COVID that COVID period told the entire world that there is a God somewhere. Even the scientists and the medical, uh, medical, uh, um, the medical field had to agree at a point that yes, there is God somewhere. God is somewhere. And so that also reminded the world that in spite of all the knowledge 
and everything. There is a God that can control and do and undo. God Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. Praise the name of the Lord. At the end of the day, the, the essence of our lesson today is to understand, you know, in, inside of God's plan, why he allows this and how we can align ourselves so that in the midst of all of this, you know, we are most useful to God. And we also understand that our time here, like our sister said and Deborah said el earlier, our time here is limited. Whatever may be the case, he has saved you. Let's be sure that he has saved us the real salvation that we need, that we have it. Praise the name of the Lord. All right, natural disasters. Let's quickly look at them. How many types do we have? Or can we just quickly name a few? If you can name a few and where it happened. Earthquake. Earthquake. Where, where, where did it happen? Give me an example of one. Turkey. Okay. Was there one in Japan? Okay. Earthquake. Hurricane Beru. Hurricane Beru. Beru. Yeah, it's a type of... It's Where is that? That's the name. It was across like Mexico and... Across America. Mexico, okay. Or, hmm? Wildfires where? Australia, okay, yes. Wildfire in Greece? Okay, okay, flood. Ah, flood, Jigawa State. God bless you, sir. <laughs> flood, yes. Oh, Dr. Vaz says it's man-made flood. Is there man-made flood? <laughs> really, there's man-made flood. How did they make it? <laughs> okay, yes, any more? Landslide, okay. Tsunami, which one? Oh, is there only one? Japan, okay. Volcanic eruption, where? Iceland, okay. Yes, more. Tornado, where? In the US. Okay. All right. Let me just read what we have in our outline. It says, um, these are catastrophic events, atmospheric, geological, hydrological origins, uh, major adverse event that results from natural processes. A natural disaster, of course, can cause, does cause loss of lives, damages properties, typically leaves some economic damages as well. Uh, the severity depends on the affected populations, you know, what they've built into place. You know, that's why Auntie said that some flood is man-made. If you build a city and you don't put sewage, sorry, drainage, right? What do you expect when rain falls? And when flood happens, you pray. <laughs> you could have just built, praise. something happened, was it in Dubai recently, right? Yeah. They've never witnessed some such before. And the, some commentators said that the city was not prepared for that because they did not build that in place. We're saying here also that God created the whole universe and he put laws of nature in place. We agree. What is one of those laws of nature? Gravity. Gravity what happens when you drop? When you jump, you go down. Another law of nature? Another law of nature? Sowing and reaping, is it natural law? <laughs> if you plant, you reap, okay, seed time, okay. Another law of nature. How rain forms. Seasons, okay, cycles, yes. Any other law of nature? Laws of nature, anyone? Kinetic, I don't understand that one. Just <laughs> say it. Huh? It's physics. Okay. Let's clap for Junior. <laughs> is that the first law of Newton or the second one? Ah, Vicky says it's number four. Is it the fourth? Oh, the third one. Okay, Vicky says it's the... I believe Vicky and you, uh, they are the ones that your father's school fees worked for you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Let's go ahead. So we're saying here that hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, results of divergent weather patterns co colliding. Earthquakes are the result of earth split structure shifting. Tsunami is caused by an underwater earthquake. But what's the, is there a difference between a natural disaster and God's use of natural forces? A natural disaster and God's use of natural forces. 
anyone. Is there a difference? Can there be a difference based on what you know from scriptures? Okay, what that means is a natural disaster and God using natural forces to, to do things that is not normal. Uh -huh. Do you know, why did you say uh -huh, answer? Please, Yanni, give us your answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When the Israelites um, wanted to, to flee, yeah, so all the plagues that, well, not all of them, but some of them, I guess, were a bit of natural disasters, I think. Okay, and okay. God, how did God use them, use those plagues? Some people were impacted, right? And some people were not. Yes? Yes. yes. You know, the people that were living in Goshen, it didn't come to them, right? Okay. Yes, you can where you wanted to say something, sir. Yes, um, I think there's a difference. But the, 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 for me, the, concern, the issue there is that when it happens, we as humans may not know the difference except for specific persons that God would have um, revealed that situation to. Yes, but generally, humans, we take it as natural disaster. Praise the Lord. Now, mm -hmm. I want to s re make a reference to something. One, I think it was a, was it a tornado or something that happened somewhere um, before the, some, uh, some years back. They said some Christians were in that land. And so they were supposed to have a camp. I think it was one, the one that the Japan, I can't remember. The, but the story was that the Christians were there. Then they had a revelation to move up the mountain. Mm. The day they moved to the mountain to continue their prayer, that was when that, um, was it called? Uh, tsunami. I think it was that tsunami period. The tsunami hit and took completely the entire area. But those people, those Christians that were to have that Christian camping were on that hill. By the time they came down, they now got in. So it could be a natural disaster. It could be something that God was using to tell a story or uh, create, uh, make a point or whatever, but, but he revealed it to those set of people that mm -hmm. were supposed to have like a convention. I think it was supposed to be a Christian convention. Thank it was you, a sir. very um, popular story Publicized. as at that yeah. tsunami time. Thank and you, things of the, 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 because they also told it in camp. I remember when I, when I went and went to, they also made to that. So, so it's just like that, but for the people we may not yes, know the difference. Thank you, sir. Praise the, the Lord. The people may not know the difference. Natural disaster skill and maim indiscriminately. Praise the Lord. But God's acts of judgment recorded in scriptures, God can choose. He can select the people he wants to. Um, and before he does that, he does warn them. Praise the name of the Lord. He can select. Remember in Genesis 19, the uh, Bible says that God took Lot because of Abraham. Remembered because of Abraham, remembered Lot, took Lot out and then set fire on the city. Praise the name of the Lord. So disasters like that, we would see it as wildfires, like we said, you know, like our brother said. Um, but also, God is judging. Amen. Um, on the other hand, also, God gives warnings to the wicked before using natural forces against them. Uh, we remember the story in Acts when uh, Apostle, you know, Paul was in the boat and he said to them, look, you should stay in this place, don't go. And they decided to go, and what happened? The wind became contrary. And they did not eat for how many days? How many days? Ah, okay. How many days did they not eat for? 14, thank you, my God bless you, two weeks. And when he finished, um, he said to them, I told you, you should not have left Crete, you should have stayed there. But God has told me, no soul will be lost. Praise the name of the Lord. So even when he uses the natural forces, he has a way of shielding his own. Praise the name of the Lord. He does not destroy indiscriminately. That's what we, you know, the difference we wanted to uh, quickly highlight. Five minutes. Why does God allow these things to happen? Why do you think God allows natural disasters to happen? Why does he allow? Yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Mm. So, 
warnings of the end times. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. To serve as warnings for the end time. Thank you, ma. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. I want to say I disagree. God okay. does not allow it. Like uh, ah. Bragwinga said, okay. God has given us, he said, the heavens are the heavens belongs unto the Lord, mm -hmm. but the earth as he given to the children of men. Mm -hmm. He has given us control over this earth. Mm -hmm. You understand, sir? That's my own take. I don't believe that God allows it. That is, I think it's, um, I can't remember one of the preacher. Yes. This, he saw a vision. Mm -hmm. He was speaking with Jesus and a, a black cloud came in between them. Mm -hmm. And when the black cl cloud came in, he was saying, you know, he wasn't able to, to speak, to make mm -hmm. the conversation mm -hmm. with Jesus. So he, suddenly, yeah, suddenly he was annoyed and he now commanded the black cloud to disappear. Mm -hmm. So he was now asking Jesus, why didn't you, why did you, did you allow the black cloud to, to come mm -hmm. in between us? He said, I've given you the power. Mm -hmm. So, so many things that we say is God that allows it. No, it's not God. We, it's us that has the power okay. and he has given us the power okay. to allow and disallow. That's my take. It's okay. Let's, let's look at your take. <laughs> so that you don't go with your take. Let's take it all together somehow. All right. We want to balance scripture with scriptures. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, I just want to take us to the story of uh, David when he did the census in okay. the Bible. And God said to him, because you have done this thing, mm. this or this is going to happen. Choose one. And he said, it is better that I fall in the hand of the Lord. And Lord sent um, um, plague among the people. And it was until God opened his eyes that he actually saw, for example, let's say it was COVID. And God opened his eyes and he saw an angel standing there with a sword. So, uh, question of whether God allowed or God did not allow. That angel, we know where he came from. We know who commanded him to go and stand there and put that sword, if it was COVID, in the midst of the people. So, that is scripture. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma. Yes. Okay, Deborah. don't necessarily have answers for mm. and God doesn't really have a desire to give it to us because we know the will he's, he's shown us some parts of his plan the mm. Bible says and then others he's kept to himself and we should be okay with that because we're not God so like for example even with Joseph and his brothers coming down when there was a famine in his land we know the reason for Joseph having gone into captivity and all of those things was to be able to be in a position for to him save. to give to supply that food so that the lineage of Christ will continue. Mm. But we don't know why that famine happened in the first place because we could easily ask, well, why didn't God prevent that famine from happening? Or even with Job and all the things that happened to him, it was mm. an individual person. But in itself, we don't necessarily know, and Job doesn't know why God decided to allow him in that gravity for it to happen. We just know it happened, and then God delivered him after. So I think it's very burdensome to try and put on us to say that we are in control of natural disasters. And I think it is important that we also don't do that because we almost start to say that, oh, if we, d if we didn't pray enough for this or do this enough, then that's why this happened. And that's very counter to the, the gospel in the fact that we've been saved not because of our works, but because of what Christ has done. And also we still live in a world that is sinful and we live in an imperfect world. So we're Amen. hoping for that new world. So if we, weren't ho if we are saying that everything bad that happens in this world is down to us, then Peter wouldn't be saying that we should hope in a new world to come because then we can just live in this one if we can make everything perfect. But that's just not the case at all. Praise the Lord. All right, let's 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 wrap up. Otherwise, we won't have time. <laughs> okay, Bro Dilly, please, one last one. Thank yes, you. Sir. A straightforward uh, illustration I want to make is from the Bible. Yes. When God instructed uh, Noah to build a hack, he said it was going to destroy, I mean, that mm -hmm. city. Yes, sir. And uh, it was God. It was God that it said God, he's yeah. going to destroy. Yes, thank you very much. Praise the Lord. All right, praise God. Please, the God we serve is a sovereign God. The day you say God cannot do this, you are put him in a box. And the day you do that, then you begin to ascribe to yourself God. Because you say that by my power, or if I do this, 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 then this is this. God can step in. God can do absolutely anything he wants to do with anyone he wants to do at any time he wants to do. Praise the name of the Lord. So we must first of all 
you know, with that lens, then we can look at what is happening around us in the world. When we say, does God allow uh, natural disasters? Yes, God allows them. Praise the name of the Lord. In the pre-Adamic world or in the pre-fallen world, there was no concept of natural disaster. The way God created the heavens and the earth it was meant to be perfect if we all walked in obedience. But all of the things we are seeing today is a function of the fall. Right? It is only through Christ and it is in that redemption that we have in him, in that world that will go in. In that world, read Revelation, there is no natural disaster there anymore. <laughs> Praise, there's no pain, there's no tears, there's no sickness. Praise the name of the Lord. So yes, it is true that Elijah said, except that my word, rain will not fall. It is true that, you know, another brother prayed and the sun stood still. God has given us powers. He has, yes, he has given us the earth to control. Absolutely true. But even when you finish praying and the rain did not stop, does God cease being God? No. Does he, is it that there is something wrong with your prayer or you're a sinner? No. God is sovereign. Praise the name of the Lord. I think that's where I would like us to, uh, to maybe leave that one because of our time. Very quickly, I'll just run through the, the manual that we have. It is distressing. Natural disasters, we call them acts of God, but we don't give credit to God for the years that we have had peace and stability. Why does God allow natural disasters? Why does it happen in our world? Praise the name of the Lord. Number one, to serve as a warning, right, to unbelievers. Disasters are warning. Unbelievers often turn to God for the first time when they face a tornado or an earthquake. People that did not know God, have you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't pray that you experience this, but if you were to be in a flight and the pilot has said, look, there is no hope, everybody, this flight is going to crash, I'm looking for the next parachute to help myself, what would you do? You will hear that, you, there you will know that there are many people, many Christians, people who call Jesus that have never called him before. Praise the name of the Lord. Number two, it reminds us that even nature was affected by sin. That's what we need to be aware of. Natural disasters remind us that nature, as beautiful as it was, it was, was beautiful, was unbroken, it was not cursed, but with sin, when sin entered, it also affected nature. And that's why, you know, Deborah said, we live in a sinful world. The world is sinful. You don't need to, you know, wherever you travel to, we live in a sinful world. That's why we are going to go to that world that does not have sin in Jesus' name. Number three, to establish God's supremacy over man. God is supreme over all men. Some disasters give no warning. Even with all the science and technology a country can afford to put together. If countries could foresee all of the disaster, you know, if we can... If the, you know, MPOX just came out of the blues from somewhere, and all of a sudden, you know, we're beginning to hear, it's, this is the first case in Europe, this is the first case here, we're seeing this. It has just come all over. The scientists did not, probably had, were blindsided, they didn't think of that. Praise the name of the Lord. So God is supreme. It just shows that we are limited. I heard in the, you know, in the news yesterday that the spaceship that went to, you know, astronauts entered a spaceship that was meant to go to space and come back after eight, eight days. And NASA is telling them they will leave them there for eight months. Because some, I'm just wondering, I hope they packed enough food for eight months. Because <laughs> I don't want to be in that kind of... Because they said the technology is bad. They can't understand that they need to fix something. So, like, as in eight days, you sent me on a trip for eight days. Now you stay in planet Earth and tell me there that is eight months. So. Ha. There's no Tesco for me to shop. All right. So it just shows that our, we are limited in our understanding. Number four, it indicates the beginning of the last days, right? This world must come to an end. God will wrap it up. It, as like the Lord Jesus said, it's just the beginning of the last days. Then also it allows cause and effect to operate independently. Some natural disasters are as a result of man's abuse and damage to the nature, to the natural environment. If we continue to cut trees, what will happen? We know what will happen. Praise the name of the Lord. So God has allowed it. He has said to you, look, plant. If you refuse to plant, you will see what will happen. Simple. Number five, it gives believers opportunity to demonstrate God's love to humanity. And this is where I wanted, this is what I was saying. That how do we fit in with all of this thing that seems that is beyond our control? What role do we play? This is when we reach out to those nations. This is when we reach out to those communities. This is when we, you know, send a helping hand. 
uh, Acts 11:28, Galatians 6, 10. Then, of course, finally, it establishes God's judgment upon the wicked. In Genesis 18, 20, 19, 24 to 25, God had said to them, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. He said, look, I've had enough. Pull Lot out and rain fire on it. So God, if he chooses to judge that particular locality, with whether it's flood, whether it's fire, that's his choice. So it is, these are some of the reasons we have in our outline on why uh, the Lord would allow this. Now, in conclusion, um, God can, let's look at this together. Can God bring something good out of a natural disaster? Do we agree? God can and he does bring great good out of terrible tragedies. Some could be, it could be the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of a clan. It could be something that you feel I would never recover from this. But God has a way of telling you that he's still in charge and saying to you, I am the one taking care of you. It's not your father. It's not your mother. It's not those people that you had as a network. I am your source and sustainer. I pray that the Lord will expand his word to our hearts in Jesus' name. What does it say in Romans 8.28? And, and we what? And we know. It begins with, and we know. So the encouragement for us this morning is, please, do you know that whatever it is you're going through, in our own case, might not be a natural disaster, but an unpleasant situation. Do you know that God is able to do what, ma? Mm -hmm. He is able to make all things work together for good because you love him. Whether the enemy likes it or not, you will understand it better in Jesus' name. And you will see that it all was part, all part of God's plan to make you a better believer. May the Lord expand his word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise the name of the Lord. I know we've gone around the house to look at different views and all that, but we started with the word. I just conclude with the word. Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 8. It's a core text. And it says that the nations rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Natural disasters. There's a tendency for us to you know, have different views like we express. But please, if you could help us with Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. Hebrews 1, 10. And probably if you have it in any of the contemporary versions, Hebrews 1.10. The Amplified says, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever and ever. And they will all wear out like a garment, and like a robe, you roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same forever, and your years will never end. Uh, message says, and again, to the son, you master started it all. You laid heart's foundation, then crafted the stars in the sky. The next, earth and sky will wear out, but not you. They will become threadbare, like an old coat. Yeah. You will fold them up like a worn-out cloak and lay them away on the shelf. But you stay the same year after year. You will never fade. You will never wear out. This is just for us to put everything in context. That the one that sits in heaven, that is called the ruler of the earth, he has a plan. Uh, the way somebody put it, says that when you you speak to any playwright is the one that wrote the play he knows when each actor comes onto the scene and when they go and that is god all we want to do is to find our place in that play and play our part because they will come what did they say in drama when your own parts uh, when you hear action when your part brag baby when your part goes you go I think our prayer is that, Lord, let me play my part well. 
It's not global warming that will end the world. He, he will fold it up when it's time. So can we go ahead and pray and say, Father, help me to play my part. I've been given back to, to, for a purpose and for a plan. That, Lord, help me to play my part well. That when the time shall come, I will not be ashamed. Lord, we beseech you for grace. That whatever may be going on around nations rising against nation, national, natural disasters and all, Lord, please help us to fulfill our plan, your plan and your purpose for creating us. That when we shall meet you, we will not be ashamed. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we are praying. Amen. So I just want to read a quick scripture. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we know that God has been giving, as we've mentioned in the prayer earlier, that God has given us so much things today and all the days of our lives. God has cheerfully and wittingly given us so much. So why not us return that, even though what we return is not going to be compared to what God has done, and actually give God our hearts, our money, everything that we're able to give him. So I just ask us, I encourage us to just cheerfully give unto the Lord. Um, the bank scriptures will be on the screen, hopefully. And yeah, I ask everyone to rise up, please, as we take offering. Thank you. Shall we rise, please? I've got joy, 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 joy. Joy, joy overflow in my heart, in my heart. See, I've got joy, I've got joy, 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 jo
thank you, Lord, for what you've given us freely. We thank you, Lord, for you've done so much for us in this month and for this year. We thank you, Lord, that we have been able to give back something small, a token, back to you, Lord. I pray, O Lord, that you continue to help us with a of having gratitude and a grateful heart that's able to give back to you continuously, Lord. I thank you for those who have given and those who haven't been able to. And I pray that you'll bless those, bless everyone here, Lord. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so now we will, or now I will, be reading out the testimonies that we've gathered throughout the month of August. Um, however you want to celebrate and congratulate people, I don't mind. We can clap between each one, I don't mind. But um, yeah. So there'll be a couple that I will say um, that have been submitted essentially. Okay, first one. Thank the Lord for deliverance. It has been God all the way. He has been my healer, deliverer, provider, and defender, and encourager. Glory be to you, Lord. I give thanks to God for the salvation of my life. Thank God. From Psalm 127, verse 2, the third testimony is, for giving me sound sleep every night, even experiencing body pain. God has remained faithful to me and my household in all ways. Number five, my health is improving daily. Thank God. I bless the Lord for he is opening scripture for me and explaining his word to me daily. Passing my final exams and becoming a certified chartered accountant, ACCA. Congratulations to whoever that is. Um, I thank God for his mercy towards my journey in life. My God is good to me and my family. For everything we need, he provides. Thank God. God has been good to me in all ways. I can't thank God enough. Next one is, I drove on the highway and slept off. Oh. <laughs> I opened my eyes in time before I hit a car in front of me. I know God will go ahead of me and put me in the right place at the right time. Amen. He will. Thanking God for his daily benefits for protection and sound mind. For God's favor over me. For my studies, for what he has started, for what he has started, he will surely perfect it. Amen. The next one is, I thank God for the just concluded youth and children's retreat. All went to the glory of God. Hallelujah. I had a cough that lasted for more than five weeks, which then affected my voice and I couldn't work. I normally will do will do with my voice but God came through using his vessel in the church to pray for me and I was healed and the final one is I'm thanking God for his compassion or his for his love and his compassion over my life my husband and my family for keeping all of my family since the passing of my mother we fought we disagreed but the love of God prevailed and kept us all together we are all united as one sibling as one sibling again He's restored my health, my job. We thank God. We thank God with more passion to pray and more love for the word of God. Hallelujah. So now we will be praying to round up this section of the service. Lord, I just want to say thank you for each and every single testimony that we read out today. We say thank you, Lord, for the healing, for protection, for the love and the and the sense of united that people have in their families and their friendships, Lord. 
Lord, I pray that as we continue the rest of the service, that we'll be blessed truly in Jesus' name. And that even those who didn't have time or weren't able to submit their testimonies, Lord, we know what you're doing for them. And I pray that we'll have even more testimonies to share within the next month or even in the next, in the next, within the next year or so. Um, as we go to the sermon today, Lord, I pray that, Father, that you will help us in Jesus' name and that we will learn in Jesus' name. I pray, amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together for you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Please, just very quickly, um, the ushers are going to pass this on to each and every one of us. Uh, what we've done here to wrap up by God's grace the month is um, we've found uh, 30 principles in life. We call it 30 life principles. So you might get number one, another person could get number 20, another one could get number 30. So maybe after service, you get to know yourselves by asking the other person, what number did you get? So they can learn another principle from one other person. Praise God. So, I mean, I've got number one here. Uh, it says, life principle number one, our intimacy with God, his highest priority for our lives, determines the impact of our lives. So whatever you get, we pray that you get some that, you know, the Holy Spirit will use in ministering to you and it can help you even in your prayer. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, without much waste of our time, can we put our hands together for Junior as he comes to take the word. Let's celebrate God's grace upon his life. Thank you. We're not clapping. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We've come to the end of Youth Takeover. The Lord has kept us, and I hope that you've been blessed. Have you been blessed for this? So we just pray that at the end of this all, that even though it's come to an end, that everything that we've hopefully by the Spirit of God imparted into people's life, that you will not remain the same in Jesus' name. So we've come to the word now, and we shall, shall God will help us in Jesus' name. <laughs> the title of my message, um, as will be, concluding like you said the youth takeover is called um the good shepherd our source of comfort um the good shepherd our source of comfort and truly i am the lord is good unto us because from the workers meeting all the way through the lord has basically emphasized everything that i wanted to say and i do believe that it shows very much so that the children of this church, the youth of this church are connected in the spirit and that itself is something that I think we should clap to the Lord for because it shows that the generations to come after will still be attached to the Lord. Our text is taken from Psalms 23, um, Psalms 23 um, verses 4. Psalms 23 verses 4b. If people upstairs can help me, but I will rush to it. Psalms 23, verses 4b. And it says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come yet again to hear thy word, speak unto us in Jesus' name. Let the words that come through to us be yours and yours alone. And let every single person here be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you because we know that you're here. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. And um, like I said, I'll be taking, or we'll be taking the last message for the um, youth takeover. And I just want to exclaim that I will try my best not to make this a preaching. It's not going to be a um, preaching. It will be more of an exhortation. Um, and I, I think that's more for emphasis on what we've experienced and even throughout this service and what we're talking about. And I really want to um, impress it upon those who have just started the faith and new, if you have started as a Christian, and those who have been in the faith for many years. And I wish to exhort you, brethren, very much. I apologize for that. That's Pastor Tile next to me. So probably he's praying for us in Jesus' name. But I, I, I feel that it's best not to preach and not to try and expose the word. Um, Paul says that knowledge does puff up, up. And better yet to give the brethren something that I feel that the Spirit is touching us 
And I pray that even with this exhortation that you will be encouraged in the mighty name of Jesus. I feel that the exhortation comes at no better time because um, we find ourselves living in a world where, well, this is factual. Um, I don't think there's been any period in history within this whole world where information is so spread about so readily. Um, there may have been disasters and wickedness going out within the world centuries and many years ago, but it's in this generation that you can be in England, in your room, with a cup of tea, and you can switch on your iPhone or Samsung, whatever you have, and you can hear about news all the way in Hong Kong. And it doesn't affect you, but you're hearing about so many things and so many evil things that are happening, you know, wicked things, like, again, through the Spirit, preaching through what we heard from um, many of us where it was talking about in the Sunday school where it said diverse things will happen, nation will rise against nations. You're hearing so many evil things. Um, one evil thing that I heard and one thing that I still can't go over is a lot of things that happen in, in Hamas. Did you guys hear about Hamas in Israel, what happened? evil things now these things may have happened again in the past but the fact that we're so readily spread around social media it's just every single day seems to be more wickedness upon wickedness you know talking about a girl who was gang raped a man as well was gang raped and they were and these men were brutal and they killed the girl beheaded her in front of the man let the man live and you're hearing about these sickening things and this is why I feel that I feel that it's not best to preach, but rather encourage us. Um, the economy, you know, it's not in the best place. We see where it's harder and harder to get jobs. It's becoming so, so, so depressing. Again, through my brother who pre or who let us led us in prayer for liberty, like depression is seizing everyone's heart because there's just so much news spread about. And for us, I feel that as Christians, there's something, this, 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 this thing that we hold on to. And again, I preach that it's that good shepherd who is truly our comforter in the mighty name of Jesus. Families are being undone. You know, one thing that I bless us, especially in this church, is that at least with the children that we have, and by God is helping us daily, that we're still intact. We're still smiling at each other. If you go out there, you see families are being undone, divorces left, right, and center. People are killing um, Sons are killing fowl, mothers and um, mothers are killing sons. Wickedness about um, the other one that I that we heard about was those um, little girls that died um, in that Taylor Swift um, um, get together. That disgusting things. Our brother mentioned back yesterday, um, last week, um, when they were doing the group session, and he mentioned and he said that going on social media, it's easy where you compare each other. And even that can lead to depression because you're seeing, <laughs> you're seeing your peers that are farther than you and you're still in the same place. You're seeing all these little things and it, and, and it gets on you. You compare your life to the people who are living and enjoying and you're thinking to yourself, what am I doing wrong with my life? You know, why am I still in that same place? Why haven't I progressed? Um, and like one of my favorite passages or Bibles, or not Bibles, um, scriptures in terms of um, story written and the good old Christian and faithful in the pilgrim's progress when they were walking and on their way and it said that, and they came upon a fair and the fair was called the vanity fair and as Christians it feels like we're walking on this pilgrim and, and there's that fair out there and it says everything was vanity upon vanity and it gets weighs you down every single day as a Christian as in what's going on where's the exit why is it happening or is there ever going to be an end to this wicked wicked people continue in their wicked ways people continue to do evil things but i feel again with the encouragement from that psalms is that despite all this he says in psalms 23 verse 4 he says in that verse b he says thou art with me you know even if I, I'm, I'm not where I'm supposed to be in life, thou art with me. Even if there are people that are farther than I am or there are things that I'm doing wrong, thou art with me. You know, even if my marriage may be failing and I'm not doing wrong, thou art with me. 
even though I may be a disappointment to my parents, I may not have done what they need to do, thou art with me. You know? And, and <laughs> you, you may look at it and you may say, well, um, everything else may collapse. Everything about may not be the thing that I want, but I will hold on to one thing. Thou art with me. So, um, this morning, because of time, and I don't have that much time, we'll be looking, like I said, at the Good Shepherd, man. That sweet, that sweet Good Shepherd who is the comforter of our souls. At two attributes, and the two attributes we'll be looking at is the first one is his presence, and the second is his instruments of comfort. Um, as we can see in that Psalms 23, verses 4. We see a man who has been through it all. <laughs> I really do believe that there is no one, one, no one better that I can pick within the holy text, like the brother David. He had been, the God's presence had been with him from youth to old age, and there was no one else that could proclaim me say, and you could say in confidence, factually, you, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. This is a man that has gone through the presence of God throughout all his stages in life, whether it be personal, whether it was a family, whether it was his career, whether in even in his marriage, you could see the presence of God from his youth all the way to his old age. And therefore, again, I like to emphasize that it's an exhortation. It's not preaching. I won't be trying to flog the the knowledge to you but for those who are starting as well in the faith and you're happy and you're and you're riding with christ in the faith and also for those who have been with him for years and i hope again the exhortation and the, the encouragement will help each and every single one of us uh, let, let's look at the young david let's look at his life we see and imagine this you see the young david and again i compare it to a young christian and uh, with the prince of god in his life you see him on the field and he's starting and he goes out into the field and he's a shepherd, shepherd boy. Everybody's at home and he's out there and he's looking after the sheep and he's looking after all these things that his father has let him or given him capable hands to do. <laughs> God bless you, Don. And you see that as he's shepherding and looking after the sheep, a situation appears. And the situation you find or he finds within himself is a bear comes. And you see this young man, and normally if that happened in any other place, you would think, run. You know, they, they don't do anything stupid, run. And yet with the passion and determination that he has, he sees the fear, he sees the challenge, and he goes, no, I'm going to take it straight on. And he grabs this beast and he slays it. And again, the next day he goes out and he's shepherd in the field, watching over the sheep, and a lion appears. And again, with the same zeal and the same earnestness, knowing that Lord is with him, he takes this beast by the mane and he kills it. And you see that presence of God just again within a young believer. It doesn't matter when you first started and you came to know that Christ, when they first believed in Christ, nothing seemed difficult. Everything that came in front of you, you were like, God's with me, I will take you head on. And that young David brings that to source of vision that no matter what happened towards him, he knew that the presence of God was in him. You go again in David's life and you see a Goliath in front of him. And that poor boy is coming into the camp and there's a Goliath and he's challenging the whole nation and he's saying that if you defeat me or someone can defeat me out of you, we will be your servants or if you, someone can... Um, if I beat that person, we will, you will be our servants. And David sees this and everybody else is quivering and shaking. And you see that David as he approaches with such disdain. He's like, who is this? Saul calls him and they, he hears that this young man's going around and he says, Don't, do not let your heart be bothered. As the Lord protected me with the lion and the bear, I too will slay this. And again, you see that in that young believer, maybe for me, where everybody else may be troubled or shaken and maybe because of lack of experience you see it and you're like well i don't care god's with me primary example probably for me when i was um in nigeria and we're doing exams oh exams in oau niger and 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 
they they would they would leak or a lecturer would want to give a test and the test would affect your credit and everybody will be running helter skelter and you see that young christian and everybody's trying to find maybe questions or something and you see those young christians that are hot with the lord they're just sitting there praying and they're just saying that wherever everybody's shaking i will seek and i will pray and my lord will help me you look at David again, fervent his life, still a young lad, and he's growing from one wilderness to another wilderness, going up and down, and he's carrying all his wives with him and people that he's had. And yet, despite all these different things that he's gone to, yet he's comfortable in the Lord. And I look again, and I, 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 haven't, I haven't been in this situation, but I, I've heard the stories of young believers who are married, and... <laughs> when they come together despite there being no food no money probably they're in like a single bedroom when they're young and they're believers and together if there's nothing that's sustaining them they're still smiling and you're thinking to yourself what's going on why are you so happy in the lord why are you so carefree and you might think back to your christian days probably if you, some of you could experience it when you were young and you um, gave your life to christ and your partner as well and you married and despite all the troubles maybe family or lack of resources you were smiling and you were happy within the lord and because he knew that god was with him And then the years go by and you start to get more gray than black on your hair. You start to understand that, okay, maybe the passion that was fire, fire has become a wisdom. It's no longer Jim, Jim. It's more of understanding. You're, 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 you're older, you're wiser within the Lord. <laughs> if we look at that scripture, Psalm 23 verse 4, um, you see him say this, you see him say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That sounds like a man who is like a seasoned veteran. He has been and he has seen it. He has, he's been through the thick and thin of it. And he's just given a testimony that despite everything that's happened, thou art with me, I won't fear. Um, my mum was telling me a Nigerian proverb. Ah, I forgot it now. It starts with where the elders are sitting. Well, oh, where the as a uh, what an elder sees uh, sitting down, huh? The young cannot see why it's standing up, and <laughs> and you see that kind of experience of someone who's walked with the Lord for many years, and you look at him, and again in. That, that he might be recalling the experience of probably like Jabesh Gilead where his men had come back home and everything was taken from them it was all lost everything had gone men were turning against him saying let's stone this guy you, 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 you've led us to destruction He's, you've lost everything and at the end of the day God brings all of it back that's only by experience you know, the old Christians that walk with God for years, you've been through it where you've seen that everything was lost. And yet, at the end of it, God seems to give you back everything. And then you go further into the man's life and he has a child, a stubborn child. <laughs> we know about stubborn children. And you have that Absalom, wayward, takes all the concubines of his father and sleeps with them in Poor daylight so that everybody can see and you look at David and that old wise man and he's thinking and he's understanding and probably maybe you within your own spiritual life as you've met many years with the Lord you've gone down that route where family has betrayed or children they don't want to listen you're praying you're praying you're praying you're praying and they still seem wayward yet in it all he says thou art with me Maybe as a Christian, you go further down within his life and you see him and it says that there was a time where kings were supposed to go to fighting and yet he stands there in his bedroom and he looks apart and he doesn't join them, but he sees something that he likes and he goes into it and he plans this and David thinking that no one has seen and he's been cooperated, sends on away. But as many Christians will find out when you're present with God, the sins that you do in secret 
God has a way of exposing it. And he goes and he tries to cover it up by killing the husband or the wife or the w- woman that he wants to marry. And he thinks that everything has been done. And then and Nathaniel comes to him and he proclaims this and he says, you have done this. And you may look down in your years as a Christian life where you have tried to hide something from the Lord. You've gone into sin. You've tried to do things that according to your own will. You've seen something that you enjoy. And the Lord has sent you, whether through the preaching on the pupil, whether through your pastors, your family, and he's rebuked you and he said, that wasn't right. And just like David, you have those scars to prove it, you know. Those Christians that have failed Lord God for years, you can see those scars. Some of them are self-inflicted. And you look about that and you say that, despite all of that, thou art with me. Despite my mess ups, thou art with me. And then you go again, when I said that the Holy Spirit speaking through your youth, I believe it was, um, I think it was Debbie or some of, one of us who mentioned that David, or no, I think it was someone within the um, Sunday school who mentioned that the counting of the people. Uh, and Shola, he said that he, he goes in these ways and he calls out Joab, his right hand man, and he says that, go, count me the people I want to know the strength of my own arm I want to know how strong I am and Joab reasons he says like listen the Lord will multiply and give you more but do not do this and he goes that go I sent you and Joab goes reluctantly and he's counted them and as they've counted them the Lord sends a rebuke not upon David but upon the people that he's followed and maybe you as a believer who's walked with God you've seen it where you've gone willfully into sin people have told you not to do it and you've gone willfully there And the Lord has not punished you, but maybe those who you love. And you've made a big mess up. And like David, you come and you want to give an offering. And then some people are saying, ah, sister, brother, it's not that bad. Don't worry. And yet you say, no, no, no. Like David, I will not give an offering that is not sacrificed to God. And you may look at your situation right now. It may not be palatable in your life. You may not like it. As an old Christian, you may see that it, it is, I'm looking for better days. But then you look and then you say like David, why am I, why, why, why soul are you downcast? He says, why are you disturbed within me? Hope yet in the Lord, for I will yet praise my Savior, my God. That's a personal proclamation that can only be experienced through years of following him. You know, and you, and I think from what I can understand, you can hope and you can hope in the end that the end of it all probably coming to yourself. You can look upon yourself and your situation and say like David, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Because of time, let's quickly move on. So we're going to the second part, and it says the instruments of comfort. What does God use to comfort us? And we'll be looking at this in four ways. The first way is the instruments themselves. Um, The second is their order. The third is our reaction. And the fourth is their reference. Um, These are the four ways we'll be looking at the instruments that God uses. So, uh, Psalms 23, verses 4. We look at the first instrument, verse B. It says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And as a shepherd, when we look at the first, it says, Thy rod. And the rod is, um, if I can put it, it's a stick. But it's a very thick, heavy stick. And the rod, as a shepherd, there are two things that the rod is used for normally. The first is for a weapon, you use it as a weapon. And the second, you use it to count the sheep. Now, as a weapon, um, as when the, when, <laughs> when, um, the shepherd has it, there are several things it does. Well, let me just break it down to two. The first thing it does is that it protects the sheep. So it's a weapon. The rod's main use is to protect the sheep from external forces. Now, no matter what may come, whether it be bear, whether it be lion, whether it be anything, the shepherd will always use that rod to protect. 
And there are times where the sheep may be the cause of the trouble, but the shepherd being the shepherd will still use that rod to protect. I am not one of those people who believe in my enemy must die. My enemy must die. Fire come. Kill everyone. I'm not one of those people. But I do know this. Whoever tries to touch the sheep of the Lord, he will use that rod. He will chase away. It is a dangerous thing, it says, to fall into the hands of the living God. So it, that rod is used not just for the, to the sheep, but it's also external to protect the sheep. But look into ourselves. You know, like I said, I, I don't believe in it, but at least I can come halfway through. Look into ourselves. That rod is used to discipline and to help. So, how is the rod, how does a shepherd use the rod to discipline? The first thing he does normally is when sheep are going in one direction, he will gather all the sheep, and it seems the sheep are following in one direction. There's always that one or two that seems to be like, nope. I ain't following, I'll do my own thing. Everybody's going this way, I'll go this way. And the sheep shepherd, being patient and kind, uses the rod and simply all he does is prods it. It'll, it might punch it, it'll prick it just to push it to the right way. And what happens is that hopefully the sheep will learn and it will say, okay, as they are going this way, I will go. But there's some stubborn sheep. <laughs> and, and for us Christians, there's some stubborn Christians. <laughs> I know because I'm one of them. And you will continue to go into one direction. And the shepherd will, will, will prod with that rod and he'll try and continue to push you in that direction. And if you do not learn, the worst thing that the shepherd can do is that, okay, no problem. So the shepherd gets the sheep, gets the rod, and he holds the sheep down. And with that same rod, he breaks the leg of the sheep. And it reminds me so much in the Proverbs, I forgot the one that it says, it says that, um, um, I forgot where it was. He who is often reproached and yet hardened his heart shall be destroyed and without remedy. There are times in our lives that every one of us knows where we've continued to go astray. Everyone's going that way in the way that the Christians and will go astray. And for your own good, God has to break those legs. And it's painful. And there's a scar. And while everybody's walking straight, you're there limping and you're limping and you're limping. And it's just that showing that he loves you. Because the worst thing he can do is just leave you alone. David knew this very well, and therefore he goes, Thy rod and they, thy staff, they comfort me. He said that my afflictions are many. He said, My bowels are eaten away, yet I will praise you. So then we go on to the stick or the staff. And the staff is not like the rod, it's not thick, it's very long. And most of the times, back in the olden days, the, rod, the staff was taller than the sheep. And again, the staff has two things that it does. The first thing it does is that it guides the sheep. And then the second thing it does is that it saves the sheep. Those are the two things that a staff does. It guides and it saves. It's long and it's skinny and it has a hook around. And the thing that is funny about this is that as the sheep are moving and they're going in one direction, however the shepherd wants them to go, you will find out that it is never the responsibility of the sheep to save itself. It is never the responsibility of the sheep to guide itself. Um, let me put this in a way. There was a person in the Bible, um, Jacob, and he went to his uncle, Laban. And basically, to make it easier for you to understand, it was in that years, for seven years or probably eight years or more, and it was basically 419 versus 4. You have two 419s versus each other. So it's 419 versus 419. And the difference between this 419 and the other is that one has experience and the other one has God behind him. Now, if you don't like the way I described it, 
blame Pastor Tayo. Don't blame me. That's how I was taught. So he, he's the one that taught, taught me that. So if there's any distribution about that, he's the one that did that. So you can go back to him. So you have 419 versus 419. And one has wisdom and years, and the other one has God behind him. And you find out that this one that had God, Jacob, made it very clear that every single time he was taking care of the sheep or whatever livestock he was given in charge, he made sure he lost none. And he said, if I did lose, it would be on my own record. Jesus said toward the end of his ministry, he said, Father, Father, look, all that you have given me, I have lost none. The sheep has no responsibility to save itself. The person or whoever gives the, per whoever gives, um, the sheep to the shepherd is accounted for. He does not go to the sheep. Who does he go to? He goes to the shepherd. Your salvation rests not on your shoulder, but on whose? Christ. That sweet, sweet shepherd who comforts us. He said, I have lost none. The sheep may fall into a ditch and the shepherd has to use the rod because that rod, I um, mean, staff is like a hook and it hooks around the neck. And that hook, it goes around the neck and it really is not um, possible for the shepherd to lift the um, sheep up just by the rod because if you do that, you'll probably break the neck of the sheep. So what he does is that he uses the staff to drag either the sheep near to him or he can get closer so that he can lift it up himself. So the sheep is drawn close by the staff and he himself carries the sheep back to where it goes. Brethren, I, I, I urge you, stop with your own strength. It goes weary. I tried. <laughs> you look back and you're thinking to yourself, I'm tired. And then God asks you, or like my mom would say, who sent you? You know, why? Why are you? Why? Again, we, we look at our brother David and he says that thy rod and thy staff, they truly, they, they comfort me. A man that has experienced it all and he can look back and he said, those things give me comfort. We go into the order, uh, we looked at this instruments, we go into the order. And if we look at that verse very, very quickly, um, I agree with Pastor Ty when he says that you can look at a verse of scripture and you can spend literally a year <laughs> and they can bring out so many things to you. In that verse 4b, he says, listen, for thou, for thy, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And you find that that one comes before the other. He, he, he was very, I'm sure, led by the Spirit, he was very careful. And it's not there by accident. He says, the rod and the staff, they comfort me. And truly, one comes before the other. And the reason why is that is because we find out that we're human beings. Again, led by the Spirit. I think you've, you've heard us talk about depression and all these things. And our sister Debbie said that we live in an imperfect world. This is the dealing that I've seen God work with men from the beginning. Whenever God is working with a man, this is how he works with them. He uses the rod first, then he uses a staff. And that rod is a symbolistic, it, 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 it's support breaking down that flesh, that, that disobedient. We are disobedient, stiff-necked race. And sometimes God has to injure just so he can put that balm on you. Um, in 1 Peter, if we can quickly open to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10. I will try and bust it myself. It says, But the blood of all grace, as we all know, this is our text for scripture for the year. We can all read it. Let's all read it together. But the blood of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, and settle you. You really see that he has said that you must suffer a while. It seems that the suffering comes before everything. 
and you find out even in, even in life and in the scriptures that any man who enters into that success into that settlement before the suffering seems to collapse you know you look at Saul and you look at David and you see the clear difference one was told you are king and he took it like that the other went through years of suffering The order is important because God has to take that rod that we use that we said to, to discipline, to chastise, to correct, to sometimes injure so that he can get his way to make sure that he truly has imparted in your life. So don't be sad in your life, Christians, when you see yourself being injured or in any ways or going through suffering. The Lord is in control. The Lord is with you. we go on to the reaction um, our reaction how do we normally react to this as Christians well it's very simple we don't like the rod you know no one likes to suffer me I know go suffer I know go beg for bread <laughs> we no one likes to suffer I don't like it it's the normal reaction it's something that we detest but David makes it very clear he goes and he says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He doesn't say one of them comforts me. He says both of them. They both comfort me. It's something that we shouldn't disdain when we go through the hands of the Lord. We should take it cheerfully and gladly. Uh, again, looking at my brother when he was talking about um, comparing ourselves to people. And we see those people on their they're successful and they and you see them going different cars and everything and they're they're enjoying life and david again going through that experience he says in psalms he says that i saw this and i was depressed i was disdained and then he said and then i looked into myself and i found out i was brutish before you i was foolish to think such a thing Paul goes and he says that if you if you do not go through chastisement then they are bastards David looked upon and he said that I saw the works of the wicked and I was I, I couldn't understand. I was fattened. Their, their, their strength does not wane. They grow in stock. They enjoy life. And yet, he goes on in the next three verses and says that, and then I fell and realized that I was brutish. I was foolish to think such a thing. It's because he loves you. It's because he cares for you that we shouldn't go and compare our lives to someone else. We shouldn't look at someone else's children and say, ah, why is my child not like that? We shouldn't look at someone else's job and say, why is my job not like that? We shouldn't look at someone else's marriage. We shouldn't look at anyone else. All we should look upon is him. For he said, despite all of this, thou art with me. What happens to a child when you give it everything it wants? spoke it becomes spoke the worst thing God can do is leave you on your way and give you everything that you request from him finally we go on to the reference the reference is very simple uh, he goes on and he in that verse 4 it says though I work through the valley of the shadow of death I fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me these things evidently point to the word of God you can confess it within your own life as you go through the scripture you read the word and you're inspired sometimes as you go through the scripture you read the word and that very thing that you've done is clear and right it's condemned you for it that rod that staff is an effect it's, it's, it's referenced through the word of God but I would not want to look through the reference of the word because we can go through that and it takes time but rather the means at which the word comes to us sometimes it can come clearly through as we are we're, we're preaching and we're I also I, I do want to apologize I said there was an exhortation I went on to explain some things the reason why I do that is because of Pastor Yetande she teaches and therefore I, I somehow manage that when I talk I teach so do not blame me, blame Pastor Yitin there. I, I, I try my best to, to, um, to, to give an exhortation to encourage, but I think you can find a theme that do, it's not my fault, it's my parents' fault. Okay, so um, we go through to that reference. 
and I said I want to look at the means and the means is one where it's to one our, to ourselves and when I mean by that is that the word of God like I said can come through this pupil it can come through preaching it can come through teaching but sometimes it can come through your friends and your family and one thing I found out was that David said that these things they they comfort me and if you look very carefully in that verse 23 verses 4 it says um, though I work through the valley of the shadow of death I fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me and you find it very clearly that David did not say that the presence of God comforted him he said it was thy rod and thy staff if you don't understand me you can see where I get the presence of God again as we're talking about that reference the word of God may come to us as human beings to one another someone may be going through down times hurtful times I'm sorry to say your presence not all the times is what that person needs just you being there isn't going to sometimes help the person God is not a God of silence. He's of action. There are things that you must do and say. And again, through that reference of the word of God, it may come through. It may come through talking to the person. It may come through giving to the person. Whether it may be, but there's something that you must do. Don't just go to someone who's going through down ties and say, Pele, it's well, or I'm here. One, one person that I know that was going through very terrible pains as a woman, and she said that, the church I feel the love but sometimes I don't experience it and she gave a reference to a friend of hers who had to take her holiday pay out just so she could go to her in the hospital and she says that, that that's love or the things that you do now there's an opposite effect to that because there's some people that they, they will say and they won't do and they make the situation a whole lot worse and, you know um, the worst thing I've ever seen a person say to another a person who had um, unfortunately miscarried a female and he looked at her dead in the eye and he said it's okay you can always have another one and I said if you don't know what to say just the reference that David is saying as we said is the word of God it may come through many ways but do not end up being like Job's friends when Job sits around and goes, why have you come? What are you doing? Give to the person exactly what the Lord has deposited in your heart. No more and no less. And I say that, I didn't really want to put this in, but I say that because of the reference that I find that within us, our normal Christianity, when we treat ourselves, let it be that the word that we give each other, not our own concoctions of what we think, I've run out of time but brethren truly this sweet Jesus is a good shepherd unto us and he's a comfort as Christians we should be happy but what about you oh sinner there's some people that here that probably don't believe what I'm saying who don't care who have their own mindset who do you go for your comfort is it your friends? Is it your family? Is it your bank account? Is it your, your things that you've bought? Like Christian and Faithful made mention of as they walked through the Vanity Fair in the Pilgrim's Progress. said, truly, everything we see here is vanity. Oh sinner, I tell you this, there will time will come where everything you stand upon will fail. But as Christians, we can proclaim Thou art with me. As Jesus stands and hides upon the cross, bleeding and offering himself, and he stretches out his arms unto you, will you not take that sweet comforter? Will you not accept his extended hand? For Christ's sake, in Jesus' name, amen.
working. Okay. Um, can we actually all pray for Junior? I think he's gone. But can we all lift him up in prayer? Ask God to replenish him. Ask God to bless him as well. Lord, we lift Junior up in your hands, oh Lord. We say thank you, Lord, for the powerful message that he gave us today. Pray that, Lord, that you will continue to bless him and strengthen him, that you will replenish him, oh Lord, and you will meet him at every single point of his needs in Jesus' name. I pray that, Lord, as a church, oh Lord, that we'll, we'll, be, we'll be firm, and Lord, in what we stand for in Jesus' name. I pray that, Father, Lord, that we'll take what has been said, oh Lord, and use it in our daily lives. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. So now we're coming on to the announcements, which is the latter part of the service today. Um, I'd like to start off by welcoming any new, any new members of the church, whether you're here visiting or you're looking for a new church. Anyone here with us for the first time? No? No? Okay. So we'll go to the regular announcements. So our normal services within the week. Um, yeah, to it's tomorrow. Tomorrow's Bank Holiday Monday, so I don't think there's any house fellowship. Thank you. So there'll be no house fellowship tomorrow, but we'll resume with Tuesday services with the men's Bible study, Wednesday in person Bible study as well. Um, as that's been done, I sure I'm sure everybody remembers that this year we celebrated 30 years of sanctuary. So there was the merch or the shirts that we got for the 30th anniversary and I know some people didn't get some um, I think the church has just received order of the shirts of the second of the shirts so if you would like to receive one I think you should direct yourself to Uncle Femi yes Uncle Femi for your shirts as well um, thank you and then I'd also like to remind us as well as we're wrapping up the August youth takeover um, for the month of August um, we have the praise night on Saturday, the 31st of July, August, 31st of August. So I think there's a promo video as well that we'd like to show you. And I've also been told that there will be food for the praise night that Uncle Ayo will be sponsoring personally out of his own pocket. So there'll be food. So please come. Um, so if we just want to watch the video for the promo. speaking in tongues before he gets home. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, sisters. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, we want to thank the Lord for just a quick reminder to tomorrow is a, a bank holiday. Time to spend time with the family so there's no house fellowship tomorrow. Um, we've been blessed with the ministry of the young 
uh, the youth and young adults uh, for the most of the month. Um, today was the last Sunday um, that we have. Can we just return the glory unto the Lord for this bright future of ours? Let's go ahead and thank the Lord. Glory be to your holy name. And in a while, Pastor Esther is going to come and pray. Um, we've seen drama, we've seen uh, all sorts of presentation. Um, what scripture says is that they will be the light of the world. We don't want them to be a light in the sanctuary. We want them to go out there and be a light. So we want to pray um, that that which they are doing in here will not just be confined here. They will be able to shine in their schools, in the, um, in the community, and that they will be the Christ that people will see in the name of Jesus. Shall we rise to our feet as pastors? They will lead us to pray for these young people. Praise the Lord. Permit me to ask you to have a seat, if you don't mind, while the young ones who lead us, all our youths rise up. All our youths, if you do rise up, yes, so that we can see you very clearly. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I want us to just stretch our hands towards this one. And I want you to pray from the depth of your heart. Some of them are your children. I want you to pray for them. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's just pray for them. We want to thank God for what God has used them for in the last one month. Let's ask, let's thank God on the behalf of the life of each and every one of them. And then let's ask that the Lord of heaven and earth, who has helped them to this stage, that he will carry them on. Let's ask that for many of them, they have confessed Christ as Lord. That they will not turn back in this way. That they will not get to a point where they begin to do that which is totally contrary to all that they have ever believed or even spoken. Ask that the Lord will strengthen them. Because you see, as they travel on in Christian life and journey, and as they grow older, like we have learned in the lesson of today, they are going to see things. Life is never straight. So we want to ask that the Lord will strengthen their heart. They will not get to a point where their heart becomes da damaged to a point where they begin to turn their back against Christianity. Pray for them. I plead with you. I want you to take this prayer very, very serious. That for them, Christianity will never be a thing of yesterday. That the Lord will establish them and firm their feet. Our brethren in the, in the other faith, they are gloating and boasting. And they are saying Christianity is diminishing in the United Kingdom. And that many of their children are come, will be coming to us. Pray that we forbid it concerning any of these children. But that they will be the Timothys of their time, the Daniels of their time, the Esthers, the Ruths, 
in the name of Jesus Christ. They have confessed the Lord Jesus. They will not unconfess him. In the name of Jesus Christ. We are grateful for what we are seeing. <laughs> but it is always the end that justifies the means. Let's ask that the Lord will keep them. It is a cry from our heart. Let's ask that the Lord will uphold them, will establish them. As he has spoken to us in 1 Peter 5 10, that the eternal God will establish them. He will strengthen them. He will keep them. He will set to them. Pray that everything that they lay their hands upon will prosper. Some of them are already working, you know, they have their professions. Could we ask for a spirit of excellence? over the lives of these children. Ask that the eternal God will help them. Those of them that are still in school, in uni, in A-levels, in whatever stage they may be in their academics, can we ask for the spirit of the Most High God to settle on them? This prayer is very important, very critical. We don't just want to pray for them at the end of the one month just to tick the box. We want to pray from our hearts and say, Lord, help us concerning our youths. They are not our own. They belong to you. Help us. We are caretakers. We ask that these ones will excel, that they will do well that none of them will become a non-entity, none of them will become a dropout. None of them will make an error in life. When it's time for them to get married, they will not pick a wrong wife. I hope you are praying. The ladies amongst them will not follow a wrong man. They will not become punching bags. It will not be that after all this investment, it is only for one man to be decking them with blows. Or for one woman to make life miserable for them. And they become a carcass of themselves. Could we ask that the eternal God will guide them? He said, I will lead you. I will guide you. I will show you the way in which you should go. And as we have learned today, he said, his rod and his staff, they comfort him. Comfort me. Can we ask that the rod and the staff of the Lord will guide them everywhere they go. They are where they ought not to be that the Lord will not allow them to go there. Pray that the Lord will keep them. Some of them will be in governance in years to come. Some of them will be ministers. They will be pastors. Some of them will be housewives. Some of them will be in, in economy. Some of them will be, you know, in administration. Some of them will be in, in any way, in IT. We are ever, whichever world they find themselves. But this one thing they are, we ask, that they will excel. They will not be a waste of space. In the mighty name of Jesus. And so we, your parents, we have prayed for you. We release you in the name of the Lord. We say, go and be blessed. We have none other. That which we have, we have given over to you. Silver or gold, we don't have. We have Jesus. We have given you Jesus. In Jesus is everything that you need for livelihood and for godliness. We pray that you will never reject that Jesus. The kind of calamity that will befall you or the kind of prosperity and comfort you will enter into 
that will make you turn your back against Jesus or query Jesus, you will never enter into it in Jesus' name. Jesus will be the Lord and Savior of your life. We release you into prosperity. We release you into godliness. We release you into holiness. We release you into excellence in the mighty name of Jesus. In your academics, you will do well. In your places of work, you will become indispensable. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You will become teacher of your teachers. The spirit of Daniel will rest over you. Everywhere you go, we will hear of you for good. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You will be a light in every way. And we mean a light in every circumstance. In character, you will be a light. In speech, you will be a light. In discipline, you will be a light. Even in your walk, you will be a light. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Whatever profession you be in, you will be a light. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Great things will happen to you. Great things will happen through you. Great things will happen for you. Great things will happen by you. In the mighty name of Jesus. We sanctify you with the blood of Jesus. From the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. We will not know your burial ground. In the mighty name of Jesus. Under the sound of my voice, none of you will mismarry. None of you will make a mistake. You will not marry the wrong man. You will not carry the wrong woman. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You will blossom. You will blossom. The Lord will strengthen you. He will settle you. He will establish you. In the mighty name of Jesus. And it shall be well with you. You have been a comfort to the church for a whole month. You will know comfort. In every way you will know comfort. And every hill and mountain before you from today will become plain. The Lord will rise on your behalf and great shall be your peace. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. In Jesus' name we have prayed. So shall it be in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I would just want to thank the Lord for the life of the teachers. And we pray that the Lord will build you homes to Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Um, shall we rise to our feet as we bring the meeting to a close? We will do well to just speak a word of peace into our nation. You have heard the news or the several news from Germany to... I want us to speak to our nation. He has a voice and say, peace be still. I want you to open up your mouth and speak peace onto the streets of England and Highland and Wales and Scotland. Forbid evil of any kind. Scripture says there was a time that the government lay hold of one of the disciples. They kept quiet and they killed him. But when they lay hold of Peter and the church prayed, it was stilled. Please open up your mouth and speak that concerning England, concerning Scotland, concerning Highland and Wales, devil will rebuke your hand. We say we refuse evil of any kind on our streets. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we speak peace upon our streets. In the name of the Lord Jesus, so shall it be. For so we decree in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we are grateful for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for your grace. Blessed be your holy name. Lord, we just want to commit into your heaven and the week ahead concerning this nation. 
we ask that your peace will reign in the name of Jesus. As we have spoken in your hearing, your word says whatsoever we allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. We say we disallow evil of any kind upon the streets of our nation in the name of Jesus. We say the weak ahead will yield his fruit of peace in the name of the Lord Jesus. Our eyes shall not see evil. Our ears shall not hear evil. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. So shall it be in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for Sister Vivian, um, whose birthday is today. We ask, O oh Lord, that you please uphold her, strengthen her. We ask that, Lord, the utmost desire of her heart, please grant us a birthday gift in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Jehovah. In Jesus' precious name, we are praying. And we declare that may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be as and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.